Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be digging into this prototype board that I just received back from assembly. And unfortunately, it looks like it contains some components that were supposed to be marked DNP and they weren't marked properly. So what do you do when you're in this situation? Well, I'm in the middle of debugging this right now, and what I'm gonna do is go through this, desolder some components, and show you how to properly mark your components DNP, so that way you don't end up in this situation that I'm in right now. Make sure to hop into the Alt Team Designer, follow along, and let's get started. So I have this prototype board that I actually built based on Mark Harris's LTE GNSS data logger. Now, this is a pretty cool project and he put it out on the Altium blog a couple of years ago. What I'm gonna do is link back to the original project in the description so you can check out those original design files. So where I'm at with this board right now is I'm going through and testing all of the different test points and a few key spots on the board just to make sure that the voltages are what I expect them to be. This is one of those things that you really need to do when you have a board that has multiple power rails in it. This particular board does have multiple power rails in it. It has a five volt rail, it has a battery powered rail, and then it has a couple of intermediate rails at 3V3, 2V5, and 1V8. This is where it can get a bit complicated because sometimes you can place test points intentionally and sometimes you have to measure off of the edge of a component in order to measure the voltage that you need to measure. Now, as I'm going through this board, I realize that there's a few different resistors that were not properly marked DNP in this design. And unfortunately, when I submitted the order for assembly, what happened is I didn't manually mark those components DNI or DNP. And as a result, of course, they got included in the assembly. So the main problem here is when I take this measurement on R88. When I take the measurement on R88, you can see that the voltage is actually very low. It's just a few millivolts here. Now, this is actually supposed to be a 3V3 rail. So what I need to do in order to ensure that we have a 3V3 rail is actually just desolder this component. What this component is doing is, I believe it's actually feeding some power uh, into another resistor divider where it's not supposed to, and so that's bringing down the voltage at this point on the rail. Instead of being 3V3, it's actually very low. We wanna get it back up to 3V3. What we're gonna do is fire up the soldering iron. We're gonna desolder this bad boy, come back and check it again, and then we'll make sure we got the right voltages. And then we'll take a little bit of a deeper look into the schematics to make sure that we can actually mark those components DNI or DNP properly. So one of the things that's important about desoldering these very small components is to have the right size soldering iron. Now, you could do this with a hot air gun. Um, with these components, I have a large enough iron here that's gonna be able to hit these components on both leads at the same time. So that's really important because if you wanna desolder one of these components, you do have to heat up both leads. The other thing about desoldering these components like this is when they're 0402 or even as small as 0201, it can be really difficult to get a tweezer around them. But one thing that you can do is you can actually just tap the iron on one of the edges and then let it heat up at high temperature. And when it heats up to the right temperature, you can just push on that component just a little bit and that component will start to pop off. And there it goes, it pops right off. You can do that with a screwdriver if you want, but be careful if you do it with a screwdriver because if you do this with a screwdriver and you're at the wrong angle, you're gonna cut right through that solder mask. And of course you could then damage something that's underneath that solder mask. So that's a bad idea. But I just did this with a soldering iron and it popped right off. Pretty simple. I've got a couple more to do over here. So R9 and R10 down on this section, I can do the same thing with my soldering iron. Just heat it up to high temperature, put it on the edge, very gently push it, and then it'll pop off. Once it pops off, you can just use your tweezers or if it's a small enough resistor or capacitor, you could just basically blow on it and it'll blow onto the surrounding sheet and then it's gone, you've just desoldered this. So now that I've got the components desoldered, what I want to do is actually check those solder points to make sure that I didn't accidentally short them with any residual solder. And you can just do that with an ohm meter. So what I'll do is I'll switch my meter over to ohms. And then of course you always want to just check and bridge the two leads together, make sure you actually get zero. What you're actually measuring here when you get this really small number for the resistance is the contact resistance between the two probes. But ideally that will be set to zero. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the two leads across the pads of R88 and then my other resistors here. And when I put the 
components across those pads. You'll notice that it's measuring a very high resistance. That's essentially what we would expect to measure here. Here, you're essentially measuring the resistance of whatever is in parallel with these two pads. If there is anything else in parallel with these pads, you will measure that resistance. But here you can see it's a very high resistance and that's exactly what we should expect. Here on the other two, if I just take these leads and pop them over here, you see that it's actually measuring an open. And then here, we're also measuring open. So that's good. We didn't accidentally leave any solder that could bridge those two leads together after we desoldered them. So that's great. We got it all done. Next, we can go back and switch the volts, plug this bad boy in. You'll notice that those LEDs don't turn on. That's because two of these resistors were actually feeding power into those LEDs. And so of course, removing those resistors causes those LEDs to no longer turn on. So now if I take my voltage measurement, let's see if we're getting 3V3 where we expect. And that's exactly what we're getting. We're getting 3.3 volts. So that's good. We removed these resistors and now we're getting the voltage that we expect on that rail. So this board should work. So maybe in a future video, once my firmware developer gets uh, the firmware written, we'll flash it onto here and we'll bring this up and we'll start playing with it and having some fun. But in the meantime, let's dig into the schematics and see what we can do to ensure that we actually properly mark the components DNI and DNP. So that way we don't have this situation come up again on the next spin of this board. So I have the project open in Altium Designer and R88 is one of the components that we needed to ensure was DNM in this board. If I click here on R88 and I just look through the information in the properties panel, we really don't have anything that indicates whether or not this particular component needs to be DNM, but we have it on an external list. The problem with this is that if you open up the bill of materials and then you just do a search for R88, you will find that R88 gets included in this big list of resistors, all of which need to be included elsewhere in the board. So some of these need to be included, but then two of the other ones, R9 and R10, those also got included in this list. So these components that we actually needed to DNM or DNP did not get marked properly. And so of course the assembler included them because they're included in the building materials. So what are some ways to ensure that this doesn't happen? Well, let's go back here into the schematics and let's just cross probe to look at R88 a little bit closer. So if I cross probe to R88, you can see it just opens and zooms in. And again, inside the schematic, we don't have any clear indication that R88 specifically needs to be marked DNM. However, if we take a look at a few of the other components that were properly DNI'd or DMP'd in our board, like R86, and we cross probe over to there, you will see in the schematic that there is a very clear indication that we should not include this in the assembly. So you can see this line of notes here, all marking this DNM. During a schematic review, if you see this, this would then allow you to then say, hey, we're not supposed to include this in the assembly. We need to keep it out of the bill of materials, or we need to give a note to the assembler to DNM these particular components. So what's the best way to ensure that all of this information gets into your bill of materials and over to your assembler so that way you don't have to go through any manual rework? Well, there's a few ways to do it. So probably the simplest way is to select the components that you want to mark do not mount and just grab those. And then down here in the properties panel under type, you could then select standard no BOM. So when you do that, these components will be included in the PCB layout, but when you export the bill of materials, they won't get included in the bill of materials. So they won't appear in this list of components that we have here uh, in the bill of materials. It will only include the list of stuff that's actually supposed to be mounted. So that's the first way and probably the easiest way. The thing that ends up happening is this ends up being project specific. And you have to be careful with that because I believe if you export a library and this is all marked standard no BOM, it's gonna export that status as well. So then when you include that component in a new project, that status is going to get overridden in that new project. So it's the same kind of thing with net ties, mechanicals, and graphicals. So what's another way to do this? Well, one way that I actually like to do instead of just placing notes like this all the time is actually to take these components and then in the comment, rather than writing the type of component, we would just write 
DNP, do not populate or do not place. Then when you export the bill of materials for this project, if you include the comments column in the export, you will then see very clearly, just like we did here with this capacitor, that it's marked DNP. And then what you can do once you get this export is you can then highlight that line in the BOM. So this highlighted line is then going to very clearly show, hey, this is included in the bill of materials, but do not place it into this assembly. So that's another simple way to do it. You can also put these notes like this. Of course, be careful because then you need to make sure that that matches your list of DNP components and you need to send that list over to your assembler when you create your order. So make sure you have that list available and that it matches everything that you see in your schematics when you do your final design review. Another way to do this is to actually place comments. So if I go down here to panel and then comments, what I can do is place a comment. I'm going to place a comment here in the schematics. And here I can just say something to the effect of DNP, R85 through R91, and then R103, comma R104. And then you can see here that we have R46 nearby, so I'm gonna add R46 into this comment. And then I'm gonna post that. So now, whenever you open up this comments pane, you're gonna see that you have these comments here that tell you exactly what is supposed to be marked do not populate in the bill of materials. So this is another way to ensure that you've always got this list of stuff here that you can then refer to that includes the important design data that you need to change. And especially with the assembly, it's going to include any of those components that you wanna make sure you don't include in the final assembly. So those are some of the simple ways to make sure that you don't include the unnecessary components in your assembly. Now, when you have these comments in your project, if you share your project with anybody or you share it through your All Team 365 workspace, your collaborators are gonna be able to see all of these comments. So that's really useful if you were doing what we were doing in this project, which was I was working with another designer to modify this original design and then add some new features to it. So of course, this is gonna help ensure that everyone is on the same page and everybody has the same data. So that's all I have for today, folks. Now, I wanna know from all of you, the viewers, how do you mark your components DNI or DNP? Do you use the standard no BOM entry? Do you just manually modify the bill of materials? Let us know in the comments because we always love to get your comments and questions. Thanks again, everybody, for watching this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.